Good morning, scholars. Today we're going to continue with part two of lesson three of Fars Homeric Greek, a book for beginners. Today we'll be covering the forms of the second of the first declension nouns uh, using boule as our example, the notions of number, gender, and getting more specific about the meaning of the cases, nominative, genitive, dative, and accusative. So, um, unlike English, Greek nouns have number and gender. I mean, English nouns have number. I talk about boy, and I talk about boys. I talk about man, I talk about men. The, ch the form changes uh, to determine whether I'm talking about a singular entity or a collective, a plural of entities. Well, Greek has not only number, but gender as well. So, um, and <laughs> it even has three numbers, strangely enough. So let's just read what Far has to say here. Number. There are three numbers in Greek, the singular denoting one, the dual denoting two, usually referring to a pair of objects closely associated or belonging together by nature and forming a closely related unified group, as kere, my two hands, optalmo, my two eyes, um, hippo, two horses uh, yoked together, a pair or team. And um, you'll also see the dual in Homer where he's talking about a pair of brothers. Okay, so um, that's very often. And then finally, you have the plural. So you have a singular, a dual, and a plural. Now, um, note the plural is often used in interchangeably with the dual to denote only two. Okay. Then you have gender. There are three genders in Greek, the masculine, the feminine, and the neuter. Okay. Gender generally has to be learned by observation. Uh, what I mean by that is you'll see when you learn a noun, you also learn the definite form of the definite article that's attached to it. And that tells you what gender it is. Okay. So generally speaking, you have to learn all that as one, but there are some general expectations that can be filled. The names of males are masculine. The names of females are feminine. And the names of rivers, winds, monks are usually masculine. The names of countries, towns, trees, and islands are usually feminine. And most nouns denoting qualities and conditions are feminine. But um, this is not really as hard as it might think. It's not that it's, it's something one gets used to uh, via that good habit of learning the definite article with the with the noun every time you learn a noun. OK. And there are a few nouns which are either masculine or feminine, as in pice, the word for child, which may be of either gender and may mean either a boy or a girl, as may be required by the occasion. Such words are said to be of common gender. Okay, so we have our three genders, masculine, feminine, neuter, and we have our three numbers, singular, dual, and plural. Okay, so the lexical form of a noun. The form of a noun, as it appears in the vocabulary, is a nominative singular unless otherwise indicated. This is followed by the ending of the genitive singular, which denotes which declension the noun belongs to. So here it's the same as Latin. If you, uh, you need to have the uh, genitive singular to really identify which declension the noun belongs to. And we'll see how that works as we move across the various declensions. But after the ending of the genitive singular is placed the appropriate form of this pronoun to indicate the gender. Okay. So thus you have teos, u, and ha. And ha is the masculine form of the uh, definite article. So it keys you that this word theos is masculine. Likewise, bule 
ace, hey, hey boule, hey is the feminine form of the definite article in the nominative singular, and it tells you that this um, noun is feminine. Likewise, algos, algos ta, pain or woe, is a third declension neuter, and that ta, uh, ta omicron, tells you that it's neuter because that's the neuter form of the definite article. Okay. Now, um, I should say here that we learned earlier that there are first declension, second declension, and third declension nouns. Um, first declension nouns are generally feminine, but there are some masculines. Second declension nouns are generally masculine and neuter, but there are feminines here and there. And third declension nouns can go either way, masculine or feminine, and they have some well-recognized neuters. So um, there's, you know, some, some predictability, but the best policy is to learn the gender uh, firmly when you learn the noun. Okay, so like I like to explain here, uh, Greek dictionaries are generally referred to as lexicons, since Greek scholars don't care to use a Latin root, dictum, something said, and prefer the Greek root, leg, lexis, speech. So, you have, if you're a Latinist, you're using an elementary Latin dictionary by Lewis and Short. But if you're reading Greek, you're reading a lexicon of Homeric dialect by Mr. Kunliff or an intermediate Greek-English lexicon by Lindell and Scott. So don't be thrown by the word lexicon. It's just the same word as dictionary, but using the Latin root. Okay. Now, the endings of the, of the first declension nouns, um, or at least the first set of endings that we're going to learn, are um, depicted on this chart. And um, as you see, we have singular forms and plural forms. We have nominative, genitive, dative, and accusative. And I have omitted the uh, dual forms because the duals are pretty rare in your reading and they're very easy to spot and they kind of take care of themselves. And I don't think there's any good reason to burden oneself um, in your initial learning with learning the duals. Um, when I studied Greek, I of course used the old um, uh, reading Greek uh, from Cambridge, and they were teaching Attic, so I didn't learn the duels. Um, and, but when I moved to Homer and started to encounter the duels, they really presented no problem whatsoever. And to be honest, I couldn't sit down and write all the duels out sitting here right now, but I can recognize one without even worrying about it. Because again, it's generally going to be talking about two, um, two uh, horses in a yoke, two twin, two brothers, um, that type of thing. So they're really easy to spot. You don't have to sweat it. So limit yourself to learning the nominative, da genitive, dative, and accusative of the singular and the plural. So basically, you're talking about eight forms. And so here, in the singular, we have a, ace, a, ain. That's a, ace, a, ain. And in the plural, we have I, own, ice, and as. Okay. Now, um, these are your basic first declension endings. And it pays to just take the singular and the plural one at a time and literally just write these out, golly gee, 30, 50 times, just so you have it um, as a set, as a schema just like it is in front of you now. But um, there are some complications in Homer. If you're just going to be reading Attic or New Testament Greek, these are the forms you need to, to learn. But with Homer, it becomes a little more complicated in both the uh, dative plural and the genitive plural because in the dative plural, um, Homer is going to have these alternative forms, one uh, eisen and the other eis and the other ice. And these will be uh, dative plural forms. And as a matter of fact, the alpha iota sigma form, which is the common form in Attic and, and um, New Testament Greek, is actually rare in Homer. 
he really goes for this eta with the other subscript sigma iota form. And that nu is a thing called movable nu that we'll learn about a little bit later. Or the second form, ace, um, with the iota subscript beneath the eta and the sigma. So you can see these variants in, in section 214D, section 9 of Smythe. But there is this complication that you have to learn or be ready for these three forms of the data plural. And likewise, with the genitive plural, with Homer, you have to be ready um, for, three ver for three different forms. Um, A-on with a long alpha, E-on with an epsilon, and on, the more common form that you'll see in Attic and New Testament Greek with just the omega with the circumflex and the new, okay? And so um, Smythe at 214D8, he um, breaks it down and gives you the dirty details of this, explaining that aon was the original form and it occurs in Homer in words like musaon, the muses, or agoraon, uh, the uh, you know, markets, marketplaces, okay? And um, the Iolic and Doric form contracts to Agoran, that doesn't concern us, uh, but go to C, Eon, this Ionic form appears in Homer as well, who usually makes it a single syllable, um, Buleon, from Bule, plan, okay? Um, and then finally, you have On, the most common form, in Homer, generally after vowels, klesion from klesie, hut, okay? And these are the huts of the Achaeans that are set along the shore among their ships. Okay, so um, you do have these three genitive forms in um, that you have to be ready for, a on, a on, and on, just like you had the three uh, um, data forms ace and ace and ice. So those are, are um, uh, just a little complication. Okay, so that brings us to the full chart where um, Farr chooses to link boule with a adjective as well because the forms of the adjectives uh, in this uh, collocation are identical with that of the noun. So you have um, we're going to decline kale bule, a good or the good plan. Okay, so in the nominative you have kale bule, genitive kales bules, dative kale bule, accusative kalein bulein, and then the vocative is the same as the nominative. Kale boule. Oh, kale boule. Oh, good plan that, you know, got me, got everything done in time. Okay, and then you're going to have a plural, the nominative and the vocative being identical again. Kalai bulai, the good plans. Kalaon bulaon, um, of, off, or from the good plans. And you see those alternative forms, eon, on, of the genitive. And then the data plural, kalese, bulese, um, and you see the alternative, ace. And he doesn't mention ice just because that's actually rare in Homer, but you do have the three forms. Um, and then the accusative plural, kalas, bulas, uh, beautiful plans as the object. So um, each of these are. Uh, Nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, of course, uh, to go over the, the meanings of each of the cases, the nominative is always the subject of the sentence. So in this example, um, you know, more, more specifically, this, the subject of a finite verb is in the nominative. So, kiros eboa, Cyrus called out, okay? Or this fuller example, which employs the accusative as well, Eke kale tea bulein kalein. Um, 
and that semicolon at the end, a semicolon is the Greek punctuation for a question. So, eke kale thea bulein kalein. Does the beautiful goddess have a beautiful plan? Because kale thea is the subject. Does the beautiful goddess have eke bulein kalein, a beautiful plan? So, these endings, recognizing the endings are very important. And the, your nominative ending will always mark the subject of the verb. Okay? Now, in that example, kiros is a second declension um, masculine. So, don't worry about that. Concentrate right now on kale, uh, bula, and we'll see the, I mean, thea, and we'll see the thea uh, covered a little later. Okay? Um, the genitive now, the most general function of the genitive is to be adjectival. It forms the, uh, it's almost just like an adjective. Um, here, the Latin grammarians, Bennett and Gildersleeve are spot on. He says, uh, Bennett says, a noun used to complete the meaning of another noun is put in the genitive. And uh, Gildersleeve says, the, date, the genitive case is the case of the complement. It is used to complete the meaning of another noun and is akin to the adjective with which it is often parallel. It is the substantive form of a specific characteristic. Okay. Hence, Smythe says at 1289, the genitive most commonly limits the meaning of substantives, nouns, adjectives, and adverbs, less, con less commonly that of verbs. So let's not make that any, it, it, that, you know, these abstractions of grammarians kind of make it a little more confusing than it is. But if we think about it um, with some examples, we'll see that, um, and this is from Monroe's Homeric Grammar, that the genitive with nouns, um, the manner in which a genitive serves to define or qualify the governing noun may be very various. I'll say, so, troon kolos, may mean anger of the anger felt by the Trojans, or it could be anger, anger at the Trojans, or it can be anger on account of the Trojans. Okay? And likewise, kolon wios eos means anger about the death of his son. So, like I said earlier, when you look into Smythe, he carves up these uh, various usages subject um, very specifically um, with great detail in a conceptual way. And um, although I don't think you really need that when you're reading Homer, because most of these in the context of the poem itself uh, turn out to be quite, pretty clear. But um, so let's just look at the English translations of some of these um, uh, phrases that end up being a uh, genitive, using a genitive form, and the genitive will always be the last uh, notion, notion, okay? So we have a bulwark in or against war. That's hekos polemoio. And a fence made of teeth. Erkos odonton. A sign to men. Teras meropon anthropon. Um, with secrecy from Laomedon, Lathre Lamedontos, with force used to one unwillingly, with force against one who is unwilling, Bie Aekontos, okay, the waves raised by all winds, Kumata Pantoion Anemon, so the waves of every wind, of all sorts of winds, okay. Bosses made of tin. Omtaloi kaliteroi. Okay, that's a good example of what they call the um, genitive of material. So the boss, omtaloi, is that stud that's in the middle of a, of a shield. And omtalmoi kasiteroio, bosses made of tin. So the town of Ilios. Iliu doliteru. Um... Oh, Doliteron, okay? Uh, Iliu Doliteron, okay? The town of Ilion. 
am o ileos takus ayas, swift Ajax, son of Oileus. Um, this genitive that you see, the genitive of, um, I guess, paternity or, um, I mean, everyone's the son of someone, okay? Achille, Achilleus, you know, uh, Achilles is the son of Peleus. So you always have this Ayas, Oileos, Ajax, the son of Oileus. Um, that's probably the most common genitive use that you have in Homer, naming the father of the hero who's actually in, on the battlefield. Okay. Daimoni a Zenon, unaccountable of strangers. Okay. Um, a pasture ground in the wood. Nomos hules, you know, a pasture of the woods. Okay. Nostos gai es. Baekon. Nostos is the return, so the uh, the Odyssey is a poem about Nostoi, the Nostoi, the returns of the heroes trying to get home after Troy. And the Nostos, Gaes, um, Baekon, a return to the land of the Phaeacians, although Gaes, Baekon are both genitives. Um, Hupsios alone, suspected by others. Alone is others, suspected of the others, by the others. Uh, going about among men, epistropos anthropon, um, rich in substance, anepos boyotoyo, um, straight for diamedid, itus diomedeos. Okay? So, the point of me showing you this is that you now have the naive notion that your genitive is always going to be able to be handled by the English preposition of. Um, you'll find out soon enough that that's not really true, but nevertheless, of or from are a good way to start. And like I say, in the uh, actual reading of Homer, uh, these, as you take them one at a time, they're, they're, they make a lot of sense. Okay. So, um, moving to the dative case. The true dative expresses the person to or for whom something is done or who is regarded as chiefly affected or interested by the action. Okay, so to put away his anger in favor of Achilles. Okay, Achillei metemen kolon. Okay, kolon is anger. Metemen is to put away. To put away one's anger for the good of Achilles, okay? Um, Achillei is a third uh, declension dative, okay? Um, alternatively, the dative case can be uh, considered an adverbial case in contrast to the genitive or adjectival case, and I'll make that point as we actually read. Um, that's just really a distinction that I came up with that I think is pretty workable, okay? Now, also to start, you might talk about uh, basic notions of the dative in terms of the instrumental dative. The so-called instrumental dative appears to have been deployed to express whenever a company, whatever accompany me, accompanies or shares in an action, not only the instrument or cause, but any attendant object or circumstance. Hence, it covers the ground of the datives of circumstance and manner, etc., so the dative of circumstance is common with abstract or semi-abstract words. So heke, with noise, klage, um, with a with a clap, with a with a with a um, you know, like armor falling on the ground, um, with a den, um, alaletoi, with a shout, enope, um, is that with a song? I'm not sure. Sige, silently. Siope, silently. Aidoi, with reverence. Ananke, ba, with necessity or force. Spude, with haste. Kake, um, I say, with evil fortune. Puge, um, in flight, he conto. Um, Kerdosune, in his cunning. And Genei, by descent. So, uh, this is another basic notion of the uh, 
data or use of the data that one will see. And so let's just focus in on sige with silence or siope silently. Okay. Um, it'll describe the manner in which something is done. And that's why I said that the dative can often be viewed as the adverbial case as opposed to the adjectival case. Okay. Now the accusative, on the other hand, is um, most often the direct object of a transitive verb. So we have, he roused a plague, he started up a plague, nuson or se, okay? Uh, he dishonored chryses, chrysane etimasen, and so chrysane, you see the alpha, I mean the eta nu at the end of that, that's our um, first declension singular accusative. He dishonored chryses, and that's going to be Agamemnon at the beginning of the poem. Uh, Lusomenos dugatera to ransom his daughter, and that's Chryses coming to ransom his daughter, who, Achille, um, who Agamemnon sends away roughly. Peron apoina, bearing ransoms, you know, bearing, um, yeah, ransom money, you know, gifts to, to, to exchange his daughter for. Stemat ekon, having fillets, these were the ceremonial uh, garb that the priest wore. Uh, Lisato Achaius, he begged the Achaeans. He kept be begging the Achaeans. So um, here, Noson, Crusain, Dugatra, Apoina, Stemat, and Achaius are all accusatives, and they are the recipient of the action of the transitive verbs. You know, he roused the plague, he dishonored Chryses, he ransomed his daughter, um, bearing ransoms, having fillets, um, begging the, Ache the Achaeans. Okay, so the accusative is most often the direct object of the action of a transitive verb. Okay, so we have our forms and translation of the first uh, declension in a ace. Kale boule, kales bules, kale boule, kalein bulein. Okay, then kale boule, the vocative being the same as the nominative. And then the plural, kalai bulai, kalaon bulaon, kalese bulese, kalas bulas. Okay. Um, okay. So that's our overview of the uh, first declension nouns in A, ace, and there's no way, I think, to learn these except by writing them out again and again. So you should go back to these endings um, and begin by writing this out, this paradigm of the endings, and um, work from there uh, with boule. Uh, boule, boules, boule, boulein, boulai, boulon, boulais, boulas. Okay? And um, like I say, you can worry about the alternative forms of the genitive and dative plural um, as you wish, but these eight forms are the ones you should really um, get stuck in your mind like a branding iron. Okay, so good luck with that. A, 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 N. I own ice os. Good luck learning your first set of noun endings. Okay, have a good day and work hard.